Hello there, and welcome to more and more episodes of The Value of Everything. Now, um, considering when I mention something about China stock market crashes and China this and China that, seem to be getting a lot of hits. So either could be that um, the uh, Chinese spy networks must love listening to me. Hello there. Recommend a couple of books. Brave New World and 1984. Um, or just general Chinese people like listening to me. Um, hey there. Power to you. Uh, um, and sorry, I was going to say something in Chinese, but I'm obviously just too dumb to even think of anything. Um, and um, or just people just like listening to um, China and um, what a fascinating country it is. Um, anyway, um, I have titled this Chinese Eugenics. Um, yeah, I might have something else at the end of it like what we fear or anything like that. But anyway, so Chinese eugenics has got you here, and um, we will do a little thought experiment on Chinese eugenics. Let's see where it takes us. Now, um, with the art of Chinese eugenics, just bear with me one second. My, yeah, I'm really frustrated with my little, uh, oh, there it is. My GPS wasn't working for a while, and uh, now it's working. Apologies. Totally irrelevant to you guys. Um, we're back. Um, so, uh, eugenics. Now, eugenics is really interesting word. It's sort of, um, especially when I hear it for the first time, I'm thinking, whoa, eugenics, what are we doing here? We, uh, we're putting ears on mice. We're doing some weird... Really fucked up shit here. Um, we're we're definitely thinking about Nazis doing some really awful shit and um, thinking about evil characters. And we're thinking about Frankenstein. Instantly, it conjures up um, the fear um, impulses straight away. Um, but. If we just l just look at the actual term of the word, um, it's not quite as what we uh, think it is, and it's it's actually all around us a bit more than you what you think it is. Um, so, eugenics is the aim of improving genetic quality of a population. Now, okay, not great for the people that don't like central planning and uh, if you're a libertarian sort of that's not quite fitting into your mindset but even so seems a little bit reasonable okay we want to improve the genetic quality and um yeah that's that's what we want to do so um uh traditionally so we have things like uh, Darwin's um, law of evolution. So over time, uh, the, the the weakest um, die off early and have less ability to reproduce, and the strongest and the fittest and the wisest um, and the most intelligent um, usually has more opportunities to breed, and um, they survive and flourish and breed more. So. That's the evolution aspect. Now, um, as we become more conscious beings and we are aware of the theory of evolution and how we can manage um, our, what, our offspring and how they turn out and all those things, so how, how we have a, um, an idea of, our, of how we would like to raise children, um, we actually practice eugenics ourselves, so maybe sometimes without us really knowing in advance, but sometimes say if you said to your kid, um, 
maybe going for the most attractive girl is the is not the correct approach maybe you should be going for happiness and approaching the girl for with the most virtues so the one who is the most productive the one who is the most kind the one who is brave can stand up for herself those if it, if a girl is um, providing a lot more of those virtues and demonstrating them in comparison to the pretty girl that just sits there and does not a lot, then that is the way you should be guiding yourself. So you are practicing a eugenics in the terms of fighting your own compulsion to be um, to just go for what would seem to be. The, the right choice at first glance to go for um, pure health aspects but um, in today's age health can be a little bit more managed um, health where it was extremely important um, in the past um, just for like just for a child to get past like child birth eight like from from uh, the age of uh, where it was uh, born to get past um, childbirth to get past like the first couple of years was an amazing feat um so health was incredibly important nowadays it's not quite there um in in because we seem to have advanced medicine um and also we do practice more eugenics on ourselves um let me just go through an, a couple of uh little interesting points so um, there is classical eugenics where, um, say, we say a government runs a or just a, a charity runs a campaign, a campaign uh, uh, promoting contraception. So, um, not having children out of wedlock and um, having unprepared children um, is a classical ideal of um, eugenics. Um, there is negative eugenics, which um, is fairly um, tricky, which, uh, well, not, when I say tricky, it's a bit of a strange word to use, um, which is basically um, sterilization. Now, you, you potentially could have forced sterilization just because um, the state prosecutes you for certain, um, certain things that you may have, like a disability or a certain race or even um, a certain mindset. Maybe you talk against the state too much. Um, so there is um, negative um, eugenics, um, that, that sort of um, sterilization ele element. Not to mention that you could be voluntary, voluntarily um, uh, sterilized. Um, I don't quite know where that. Let's say I don't. Maybe you're a paedophile or something like that, and you choose that this is the wrong um, route. This is this is what's causing you all your problems in your life, so you choose to be sterilized. I don't know. Maybe that's that's a, a, a voluntary method of sterilization that wouldn't necessarily put negative eugenics in a completely bad light. Um, then we have. something called um, positive eugenics. Now, positive eugenics um, is where a government can give financial incentives to having um, more children. Um, you can have tax breaks for more children and you could possibly even tax the ones who do not have children. Um, so that you... Uh, Burst the population, which a lot of governments do do, um, and that is another method. And um, this is probably so. So there's th those phases which pretty much didn't really come to mind for me anyway. When I, the first thing that uh, came into my mind when I mentioned um, eugenics, um, but there's um, the the final one which um, I think everyone's quite aware of, um, which would be called new eugenics. Which is um, items like uh, prenatal diagnosis of genetic disorders. Um, so, um, if there was a defective um, fetus, 
then it could um, th- that could be pre-diagnosed and it could be ter- terminated early. Um, that that kind of screening does occur nowadays. It's everyone's far aware of it. Um, I th- if you just do a little bit of um, information on the statistical data based upon um, uh, people that. Um, are aware of children having defects, um, maybe not even sort of completely disabilitating um, defects like something like uh, Down syndrome, but would require a lot of care. Um, there's still a v- extremely high um, ratio of terminations which are decided upon. It's, I, you would have to correct me on this, but it's something on the region of about 80%. So eugenics is applied, particularly in the, the Western world, um, to a very high scale on, on itself on in the terms of new eugenics. Now also, um, when I mention um, Chinese eugenics, you're, you're thinking about the, um, the ability to improve the strength, the intelligence of one's person. And I'll, I'll get to that um, a little bit later, but um, yeah, we, we just we need to cover a little bit more background on the subject before we um, dive straight into um, that little uh, area. So yeah, so there's one area that I think um, we, we need to look at as well is that we do do selective maybe breeding is not the word, but um, when we look at our farming um, throughout our agriculture, we have been selecting good crops throughout time and we have been using the, the best crops, the most hardy crops that can survive um, the, the droughts or the rains and um, we do practice um, our own sense of eugenics on um, farming. Um, I'm not sure whether eugenics is the correct word when you you apply it to agriculture. You'll have to correct me on that on that area, but um, it is something that um, uh, human beings have been doing f- for a good few years. Um, and um, the eugenics of the mind is definitely something that you cannot deny has existed in in today's day and age. And um potentially over time maybe um because i would say that the woman chooses more so than the man maybe women have chosen to go for the more intelligent um uh people in the tribe rather than the the prettiest um guys in the tribe because we're not all pretty um, we're not all 10 out of 10s, but there are certain, there is a lot of biodiversities that, which are going on, um, and there's a lot of trade-offs which are going on. Maybe I might not have the prettiest man in the world, but I've got the most intelligent man in the world, so um, there's definitely um, def- a certain amount of uh, trade-offs which are going on um, throughout our evolution, which um, suggests that um, people are f- very aware and very conscious of the... Um, child which they're going to raise in the future um, and the environment that it's going to be putting being put in now some people are going to be less opposed to that some people are going to be a bit more little bit more inclined to be impulsive in terms of their decisions and some people are going to be um, a little bit more long-term thoughtful on their choices so just think of that in the practice of eugenics when it just comes to the way that we look at our mates um, or lovers. Um, the next one which would um, be interesting is that there's a definitely uh, you, you can see the, the amazing uh, well, it is amazing in, in terms of what we've done in ter- uh, for dogs with um, selective breeding um, only for a, just a few thousand years. Um, humans managed to uh, breed in and breed out a number of traits when it comes to um, yeah, the dog populations. Um, I think there's, there, there was like a n- number of key sort of um, 
animals obviously there's a there was like a wolf there was maybe like some kind of jackal sort of um creature like originate originating from those points there was a very small dog there's a very um like obviously the wolf kind of dog and these um had probably the correct amount of um, chromosomes so that they could mix up and over time we, we've selected breeding we've we've chosen um traits that would be more suitable for us um it's interesting how in the past dogs were more so um uh chose for um for work and production so we would look for dogs which were good at um rounding animals we would look at dogs um for um carrying things i know i remember there were some dogs that used to be like a poor man's horse um some dogs which could pull in boats as like the newfoundland um or and then obviously you have your traditional guard dogs as well which um could protect your land protect um, um protects for from other species which could invade your land um uh, protects from other humans um so and um oh yeah there's the nose as well so we use the the sense of the nose from the dog which maybe may have been improved over time with a better sense um so the the the, the better senses of smell dogs um would be bred in better over time so that it, it could improve the hunting so you get air scent dogs which sniff in the air and depending on the wind blows they might get it first and then you've got ground scent dogs which um can follow the trail that way so you have um and also you've got sprinting dogs as well that can chase and chase down um prey as well really quickly so and just generally get rid of vermin so we've mastered um ridiculous amount of um character traits um well just general traits um throughout history with dogs um but nowadays um we seem to have we like companions now and we like um we seem to find ourselves getting out uh, get a little bit lonely so we do like um dogs which um are non-aggressive and um are kind and always want to be um with you and not lonely we do like the the ver and uh, it's it's very suited to how the dog is being at like a man mammal and a very um big on its pack um animal is suited to us as human beings seeing that we are pack creatures as well very well so we now seem to be choosing to go for more of a companion animal um yeah so there's there's that that sort of information which goes out um uh, the problem that we do have, um, and this is a little, li little uh, early warning, and I think, um, oh shit, um, is that we, as we um, start to selective breed um, dogs and we start to isolate them and we create more pedigrees, I think people are quite um, acutely aware that where we um had a very wide um spectrum of um what's the word well let's just say we had a very wide um spectrum of dna to select from um we where we create pedigrees we narrow that down more so and more so and that means that defects can come out far quicker whereas um you could if if you've got one defect gene and on the other side for the male and on the female is um doesn't have a, a defect gene then you can generally remove the defect um, but if the defect is um, common on both sides then that's definitely going to come out so there's um i know that for large dogs sometimes they have spinal problems um the hind legs don't work there's 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 a number of different um the, particularly the pedigree dogs the highly specialized selectively bred dogs we find ourselves in scenarios where there are trade-offs for the certain way that we've bred them to the amount of defective genes which are 
uh, happening in that sort of um, that realm. Now, not to say that if um, eugenics in the future probably could highlight and spot what those problems are and then repair them, but it's I still think there's a certain element of trade-off which will always occur in the realms of um, of um, mutations and character traits and um, specialization when it comes to um, creating certain human beings. I think there's there's a number of trade-offs. Even us as humans walking around today, um, I'm a fairly large guy. I, um, I can put on muscle really well and I've got a fairly good st- stamina. But when it comes to working in an office environment, it's not quite kind of helpful. I seem to put on a lot more fat than usual. However, get me down to the gym, I'm putting on muscle quite quite rapidly. So it would seem that my body is probably more in tune to being um, in a sort of more physical environment. And probably a couple of hundred years ago, I would have been quite a good worker when the forklift truck would have been uh, not around. So yeah, there's there's that interesting element but um so there's that certain trade-off of being this this big guy um still some people prefer to have it's it's kind of handy when you're moving a house to still have this large frame to carry things around but um it's a trade-off I'm, and there's there's a number of things that i could be good at and there's a number of things that i'm not good at i'm i'm not going to be the fastest man in the world when running around a field when playing sports so that's that's a definite trade-off um and say if i was a very skinny guy the, the total opposite effects happen to me so um with every selection of um a certain aspect which we think is fairly um fairly beneficial we have a trade-off um i would like to go into another realm of intelligence now intelligence is um fairly sometimes tricky to understand and there's different levels of intelligence that we can look at now the general idea of like iq intelligence would be certain amount certain high levels of pattern recogni- recognition where you can perceive a pattern um appearing in the future so then you have a high amount of problem solving skills where you can you can see that there's a pattern um, occurring somewhere else and you can apply it to some other element so that gives you a good idea of producing so you can um, so you could create and engineer something by taking a, a derived amount of ideas from somewhere else and apply it to, to some other points also um, traditionally where it comes to grades in schools and everything else like that um, we definitely seem to uh, grade highly um, our abilities to be analytical and to uh, um, recite information, retain information, and then uh, maybe this is the incorrect word, but um, regurgitate information again onto an exam paper. Not to say that um, I would say that that's probably the most ideal um, trait to have, especially in the future, but that would be um, a, a, another sign of intelligence. Now, um, we also have another um, element of um, intelligence, which I'm I'm very aware of. I'm not I'm not haven't done too much of a study on it, which would be emotional intelligence. Um, and I guess in that terms, you can tell that some people have a very good knack and ability to be very sociable, very um, personable with other people, can make them smile very often, make them feel very welcoming, um, is able to um, get their needs met by other people whenever they um, go down to customer service, people are willing to help them rather than pushing them back. There is um, definitely, um, especially in the area of sales, you do have the more personal that you are, the more pers- the way that you can be- relate to the other person, um, you have a high amount of emotional intelligence. But um, I guess it's just 
you're just a really nice guy <laughs> or, or girl. Um, but yeah, so there's there's certain levels of intelligence which which are going on there now. I gonna make a bold prediction here and say that maybe the Chinese are looking for the high IQ, maybe pattern recognition, and the high analytical um, um, uh, sort of memory retention sort of uh, thought processing. So um, here I have some questions. So if we're creating um, this super mind, which is going to have the ability to retain incredible amounts of information, be highly analytical. Um, do we have an issue with um, trade offs? Um, I know that with certain. Oh, this man's got a heavy exhaust going on here. Brilliant. I'm going to just be breathing up his smoke all the way. Don't really fancy that. Um, so yeah, so say so less we're going for this high IQ pattern recognition um, analytical person. So we're going to go for the. So what um, what we I hear in newspaper reports and articles is that um, the Chinese has got a list of um, uh, like the genetic structure of. Tell me if I'm. Uh, turning this science into a load of uh, crap coming out of my mouth because um, I'm not a scientist, but a, they're getting a number of um, DNA structures, say 20,000, and these have been highlighted as uh, people with extremely high IQs. Now, these people with extremely high IQs, um, we got to ask uh, certain questions. Um, number one um, thing as a philosopher, are these people happy? <laughs> are they are they happy well-rounded people? Are they uh, do they live in really happy lives and are they having a good time? Um what is their state of their emotions? Um you got to you got to just quickly ask those questions. Now also some of the greatest minds that we've ever had have had extreme um well certain um brain malfunctions i know that asperger's syndrome there's um certain i i can't be 100 percent sure that this person does have it you'll have to correct me some people will always debate whether this person has that or not but i i i've heard that einstein had um dyslexia there's um there's a lot of trade-offs with intelligence and what um can occur in the mind once you start smashing up the um the IQ. Um, I understand that over time that our IQs have been increasing rapidly. I understand that when we spoke to our grandparents, they weren't, they're not as switched on as what we are today. But um, even so, yeah, we've got to, the, the Chinese say they are taking out this, this certain gene, they're highlighting certain genes which um, give us higher uh, realms of intelligence. What is that, what is that gonna do to that person? Um, so, and then, yeah, I'm not structuring this very well, sorry. My apologies. So yeah, so we're gonna think of that in that respect. Um, and there's a certain trade-off, and we have to look at it in the terms of, um, problems first is is it going to create more problems than solutions now i think the the chinese states their their aim would be to have a highly productive um non um questioning um uh viewing uh population who can analytical population who can produce some really good gadgets um, that will be able to be sold into the market and for it to be the number one um, society. There is um, a good study that says that if you've got, if you can increase um, the highest, the population of the highest IQ people into um, into your country, then um, you, it really does increase the GDP um, in that respect. So um, there is definite profit motives of 
trying to get um, highly intelligent people. Um, so let's go a little bit more into the moral aspect. Say if you was, and just think on your own terms on this, I always, I don't want this all just to be me, me spewing out my ideas. Um, say if you were a child of eugenics, um, you were selected bred and certain of your, certain amount of your genes were removed and replaced for these other genes, which were chosen to be more desirable. How would that make you feel at first? Um, just ask yourself a few questions in that respect. Um, that, and how does that make you a happy person? Um, so just question yourself in that respect. This is another question which I think is even more pertinent. Um, this question would be, um, if, and I, I must recommend, if you, um, if you haven't watched this movie, watch Gattaca. It is the, one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, and it does cover this um, subject a lot. Um, if you have an incredible amount um, of intelligence and society from day one knows that you all, you, all you're gonna do is achieve, um, there is a certain level of expectation that is put upon you. Nothing else but expectation. And any less than you achieving this expectation would be a marker of your failure. Um, so just think of that in that terms. I think that's a really um, interesting um, perspective to take on in terms of if you are a child of um, high intelligence eugenics. Um, it does make you think in that respect and, and how, how it makes you, how all those functions. And particularly say if you've, you've been given all these these genes which make you highly analytical and it's just sort of cut out your personality in the same in the same realm so you're just the, this this mathematician that can't really relate to any girls or anything like that and you, you can't chat to people down the pub or anything like that and you're just oh great i've i've got this heightened level of intelligence but i'm not in, i'm not at all happy i can't communicate communicate with um, my friends and i'm a little bit of a loner um, I, I guess that um, if you are practicing eugenics, you really do need to like look at this happiness thing. You, you, I, I do think that's um, a gigantic mistake which um, you could be walking straight into. Another thing which I um, I keep on harping on about is that centrally planning isn't quite the. The correct mythology of approaching intelligence. Who knows what type of um, intelligence we require in the future? So I, you know, that um, if, you, if you've gone through a few of my things, I've mentioned that um, there's going to be singularity and there's going to be AI. Um, who knows why we need this really good biological brain which understands um, and can analyze information um, that great when? Already, we've got a lot of information on our fingertips. We're at the age of um, information, so um, you could be designing something which is very um, outdated. Um, throughout um, previous years, say say two hundred years ago, it was quite useful retaining information, being analytical, and then reg regurgitating it. Nowadays. It would seem that the um, the people that can um, uh, who, who don't really retain information but can be quite good at being creative and come up with ideas um, and has all the information at their fingertips, it it would seem all the indications would say that that is a lot more um, useful. Now. Um, me being diagnosed as um, dyslexic in the past, um, I think it's kind of interesting nowadays, um, uh, particularly where throughout my education I've been um, shown to, um, well, I was um, everything, every, everything signaled to me as a, as a young child to be a failure. Yet as time progressed, it would seem that I had, it seems that I have skills which I can sort of, master and use and i do seem to be able to come up with a lot more ideas than um 
than uh, people that I work with. I don't know whether it's just the people that I work with or not. I, I'm sure that pe- um, the people that I'm, who are listening to me right now are probably just as good as me. But um, it's it's interesting in that respect. Um, dyslexia is um, a defect of the mind. It's it's classed as a defect of the mind because I think um, there's a certain element of communication which is going on in the brain which is um, stopped between the left and right hemisphere. Um, and yet, um, the brain has to work a little way around that defect, and that gives us more use of the spatial mind. And the spatial mind can um, definitely give us this very interesting perspective. Also, um, um, I just remember just reading something interesting on uh, dyslexia yesterday, is that um, we have a better, or if you are a dyslexic, but... Um, I have a better ability to learn things um, from the top down rather than from the bottom up. So I like to take in the big picture. You might find that in the way that I speak and structure these um, podcasts um, and then go downwards into the little uh, nitty gritty rather than start from a very small piece of information and then just building from that. I think maybe I, I, I think that generally people would prefer it. Um, top down rather than uh, bottom up but that might be something to do with our education system and how governments do not like us to know too much about um, what they're up to um, yeah so interesting little twists um, I could um, I could talk forever about this uh, the subject is it's very, um, it's very interesting. I'd just like to throw in a couple of um, other little ideas. Um, now, when when the words Chinese eugenics is mentioned, remember that I am mentioning a race here. I'm not like a race of like um, the, the continent of Asian people. So when I when you click through to this thing, you've got to think to yourself: Is this? Um, is this playing into the part of um, racist impulses where you're saying, oh my God, it's unbelievable that um, the Chinese should be doing this kind of stuff. You've just got to think to yourself, well, how well does it um, fit with you when we talk about American eugenics um, or British eugenics? Is it acceptable then? And um, just to, to look at it in that perspective, you've got to say, okay, right, well, if it now sounds a little bit different or Australian eugenics... Now, if it sounds a little bit different to you, um, you got to ask the questions why. No, okay, maybe it's because they have less regulations and they can go a bit um, like crazy and start um, building this multi-eyed, multi-eared creature. But um, maybe it's something else. Um, and you've you've got to with this eugenics thing you've got to think of the racial aspect past of it there's american eugenics which um for sterilized um uh, undesirables people with disabilities there was um there was um sterilization of the back black population as well which was um, a horrendous thing you've got to look at nazi eugenics which did pretty much the exact same thing as that as well before so there is a highly um, racial component when it comes to eugenics Um, you are being discriminatory um, when you're choosing certain traits and you're choosing certain traits especially to remove um so um be very cautious um where we walk down this road um that your uh mindset is not in the right place and you are you're culturally inclined to think in certain ways i may be that way inclined as well so um just be wary of the way that I structure this conversation and just make sure that my um, my cultural heritage and the way that I've been brought up is not giving you a certain narrative to think in a certain way. Um, okay, now. Um, so. Yeah, so this selective breeding and this removal of certain traits does give us um actually just to mention as another thing um for some reason dogs have a 
maybe because of the, the the few like very high spectrumed animals that they start from the beginning, they have a have a massive variety of DNA structures that they can pick and choose from to add and remove certain character traits. Um, human beings don't have as many. Um, even though there would be, it would seem that with there's some large people, there's some small people, and all those that kind of stuff. Um, there's it's we're with a little, a lot more narrower in um, our gene sets and what we can do. So the way that we can structure things is a lot more limited. Um, so in, it's interesting in that respect um, of how um, things are structured. Um, going back to the Chinese, anyway. Um, so remember that. Um, Chinese uh, programs have eugenics programs have been in place. The one-child policy um, is definitely um, could be perceived as a certain type of um, eugenics pro um, program. In terms of, um, in the past, you would have city people who um, would not populate as much as farm people, and you could potentially perceive that the city people might be more. Um, intellectual, better at theorizing things than farm people who use their hands and man manual labor and stuff like that. So by applying at that certain level of um, one-child policy, I think in the mid-90s, um, you do have an ability of creating more city-like folk rather than more farmhand-like folk. So um, there's just that little, um, yeah, interesting little twist of um, how government policies can definitely um, change DNA structures of people. Um, I, I can't think of how inc like profound how well, how it, how saddened it could be that like somewhere like um, Cambodia, where all of the most intelligent uh, people, the the most outspoken, the ones that just ended up with glasses on, got um, got exterminated, and it. Just, just so that one uh, leader just wanted a complete peasant race and bring everything back down to year zero with um, Pol Pot so, and his killing fields. Um, it, like that country's pretty fucked now. You, there's no way that, like, um, unless people see opportunities in, in there and resources and rebuild it from scratch. If you ripped out all of the most intelligent people, that is a humongous, um, like impediment that the Cambodians have had now with in terms of that I know that there, obviously there's some people that can hide out of it and there's some people that have had potential in in poor levels and were quite high intelligent but not without without wrong in the wrong environment they they never flourished there has that been that potential but because now they're surrounded by a lot more people that are haven't got the ideas and tricks to move on and the pattern recognitions that country is going to struggle struggle for a long for a lot more years and um, when you think of the general IQs of people, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the statistics are for Cambodia now, but it must have, it must have got crushed in terms of um, that sort of u type of eugenics program that applied there. Um, Asians are far more intelligent um, than um, Caucasians, white people. Um, it's a known fact. Uh, there's, it's, it's an interesting element. Um, but yeah, remember... This this goes back to my sort of selective breathing and stuff like that. If um, <coughs> I, I know obviously we're still in the realms of the American Empire, and um, that seems to be doing all very well. Well, just about hanging on. But white people seem to be getting on all right. They're not they're not doing too terribly. We seem to um, still have highly paid jobs. We still seem to work in creative jobs and all those kind of things. So. Um, it's not, it's not too out of the uh, the box that IQ can push on just the the pure production element. Um, what's the point I'm trying to get to at this point? Yeah, there's there's certain elements, and I'm I'm trying to say that there's like character driven, there's confidence, there's approaching things um, with new ideas. Um, if you are a highly intelligent person but extremely shy, you're going to struggle. You, there's, there's no way around that. No, I'm not saying I'm not trying to pigeonhole that um, Asian people are shy, but I'm just saying that there's there is that sort of um, that, that there's, there can be that inclination that happens. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I remember one thing about um, the Japanese with um, the way that the structure of management happens sometimes where, um, I might have mentioned this on a previous podcast, apologize if I have, um, a, um, so especially with Jap- Japan, um, so also, yeah, just this is another little thing that just popped into my head right, right now. Um, there's always this fear that, um, especially with the, the Americans, that somebody's going to take over their um, their number one spot. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's part of life, really. But um, in the past, there was this thought that Japan was going to absolutely smash America in the way that it could produce things. And it was a hardworking, highly productive country. And um, it was on that sort of um, set until everyone realized that there was a big money expansion problem and then they just ever since have been in this continuous state of stag um, nation or stagflation and um, humongous zombie banks which um, is sort of the current state that we're living in right now but um uh with um the japanese um style of uh doing things there there was a certain level of order which was applied where the boss would be the boss and um, say if you went out for drinks after work the boss would be the last man standing and it was disrespectful for you to go drinking beyond the boss's time Um, it would be disrespectful for you to start saying well I don't think that's a good idea I think we should do that instead Um, so instead where you see that the um, uh, rather than channeling incredible new ideas in the business sense, Japan had absolutely mastered the idea of in, um, innovating things and making things more smaller, mechanized, more um, more efficient, more ro- uh, uh, better production lines, producing like highly reliable cars. <laughs> Um, faster goods yeah so that there's there's all those little elements however you don't necessarily see a complete new channel of um, ideas which come out of that due to the fact of the top-down structure of the way of thinking so just just think of that in terms of how intelligence and structure and how um, you're going to have a centrally planned intelligence um, ideal which might not give you the kind of rewards that you require. I think you do need like a fairly liberal platform of thinking and, uh, and ideas in a business and um, that, that could give you incredible ability to produce some amazing goods and incredible ability to create humongous failures. But um, that is the art and the creative destruction of capitalism. Ah, we fear anything that could fail. Um, so, yeah, so we there's biodiversity. So if we specialize and we create more selective breeds and everyone goes, hey, yeah, we need to have these really intelligent, um, blonde-eyed, blue-eyed people in our lives. <laughs> Um, maybe I don't, maybe the Chinese don't really want blonde eye blue people. Maybe they want um, uh, different types of um, uh, things, uh, attributes that they 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 prefer. Um, then, then, um, if everyone starts to breed with that stock, then we could create less of a biodiversity in that respect. And remember, sometimes perceived problems problems that we've got in our um, gene set can be amazing um advantages in the future um there's a lot of theories remember the the um the closest um species that we had to us once was the neanderthal um we now believe that um the neanderthal i can't i'm butchering that word um uh bred inbred with us in the end because um it was um, just getting died out of uh, out of the tribe, but it I guess that um, interbreeding gave us a hell of a lot more biodiversity and gave us a lot less um, genetic defects and potentially 
gave us um, some assets that the, they had, which probably was increased the amount of strength, stamina, um, uh, muscle, and bone mass. Who who knows in that respect what what assets they gave us? Um, we we are inclined to believe that that animal, or, or when I say that animal, that species of humanoid was um, uh, less lesser than us, but in certain elements and in certain environments, that um, certain attributes would have been highly um, favourable to us. Especially if you've got this um, huge man, he would have been incredible in battle. Um, so to have that in in our um, tribal stock, that would have been a, a massive, um, brilliant feature. Maybe not; it wouldn't have been that fantastic for um, just like organising your battle, but for just a, a pure fighting sense, you've got. And if you had the correct minds that could uh, manage that at the same time, you've got this um, complete battle machine of highly intelligent people organising your structure, and then the the battle hardened. Um, the Thanderthals um, at the front who can um, just pick up a man and throw him 20 metres. Who knows? Um, so, But I'm not saying that we all need to be incredibly muscular and um, uh, powerful. But yeah, so th there's all these benefits. Imagine if um, we all decide that we want to be these big, giant, um, muscular um, creatures, then um, we ain't going to we ain't going to enjoy our time sitting on planes too much. There's certain hope and praise that when you see a um, person of an Asian stature that comes to sit next to you, you're like, oh my god, what a wonderful world we live in. But um, when you get this big fat western person come down to sit next to you, you're like, fuck this. This is fucking shit. So um, biodiversity is um, incredible. It should be... Um, praised we don't really sort of hear about it enough um and um it should be respected and the more that we selectively breed and structure things to be a certain way inclined we as a population potentially could put the blinkers on certain ideas and ideals that may empower us in the future and m may hold the secrets to our own survival as well in the future Perhaps we might get a load of despot people in charge of the governments and really what we just needed is to have that capacity of putting on shitloads of fat and weights because we're going to have a few famines coming around the corner. So um, hey ho for the fat people, we're going we're gonna, to um, reap the rewards of the land in the future. That, that might be just the one thing that we need, who knows um, what's coming around the corner unless we... Um, take power of and power, the power of our children and apply the correct eugenics to our children so that we live in a peaceful beautiful environment where we can voluntarily trade with each other without the oppression of people taking things from us by force um yeah so just remember the uh the term for the greater good that can be a dangerous thing to use um, for the greater good doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else is particularly happy you could have the greater good being at 51 percent so um you got 49 percent of people which are very unhappy um be um very mindful of those facts um what else can I round off? Let me just um, give this other driver a little bit more space next to me in the car park. Or oh, he's going to just smash his door straight into my side. Um, da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this, there is um, a couple of little other little things I would like to mention. Um, yeah, there's how how the future could look if we do have eugenics which are applied to human beings um, there's interesting things about sporting and doping so in the past week you could just take a performance enhancing um, drug or chemical and that would improve um, your muscle mass and speed and endurance and concentration um, now we have the ability to uh, adapt our genes just before anything else happens so 
Um, how would that be applied in the sport world? We would have to have some just like humongous mutant um, powerhouse um, injected um, American football sort of thing going on. And um, then we would have to have like the au naturel sort of um, sport, which happens where just people are just general and non genetically uh, modified. But I don't know how you would be able to detect the difference between those things. Um, if, if, the pr the problem is is that is that you're losing the voluntary aspect because you're not the person who chooses to um, have if if you're applying that gene to you while you're alive then it's your choice then it's perfectly fine if you're applying it to your child it's not necessarily like their choice and you have changed their DNA structure but you could put forward the argument as well it's not exactly their choice that they should have um, defects and I'm sure that they probably would not choose to have certain um, debilitating defects um, if given that choice. Um, there is certain things which um, happen in life that if somebody is given a certain defect in their life, um, they challenge it and they push forward and there's, I, I'm probably using the wrong word, but there's a determination, a human spirit which makes us so beautiful in this world, which will fight us on through that. And especially when you look at the, the Olympics, and stuff like that you can um, when you look at the um, Paralympics in fact um, you do see that beauty in it you, you definitely see when you compare the Olympics to the Paralympics the Paralympics does show that beauty of the, the human mind how it can master things in sheer adversity so if we create this perfect superhuman race we don't have that that imperfection who can who wants to strive and fight and really attain and achieve things um, under the, the sheer um, adversity of the environment that, that they're living in. Um, I um, There's other things, uh, just other quick other little things. Sorry, this is a little bit unstructured, but this is just a few of the other notes that I'm just coming through to, um, that I didn't read off when I was um, glancing as I was driving. Um, there's uh, another effect of um, that if you do have this incredible intelligence, there is some um, signs and signals that if one where you have more intelligence and if you're part of the Western population, um, you generally choose to have less children. So um, even so, you're going to, um, as you increase the intelligence of um, uh, uh, our population, sometimes that could have a detrimental effect of the population as well. So it could have a ne negative effect by creating hyper intelligent people that choose to have no kids. Um, so there is that respect as well. Um, I don't know why I mentioned this, but it's um, a really touching thing that I got really upset about when I was a kid. Um, I was um, watching The Fly 2. Um, I used to like horror movies as a kid, a bit strange, hey? Um, but um, there's a scene with this dog, and it's not quite eugenics, it was teleportation, but um, uh, the I don't know what happened, but there was this horrible um, scene where the dog got caught up in um, the uh, um, in the uh, teleportation with something else. Potentially, I'm not sure quite what it was, and it came out as a hot, like you could sort of see it was still the dog, but not quite. And it was this this fairly horrible monster that screamed, but was you, you could tell that the heart of the dog was there. And like when I say the heart, the the, the caringness and the the, the the, the nice part of the dog was still there, but it was just a complete mutant at the same time. It re really did tap into me emotionally, and I don't know whether that is some kind of metaphor with the eugenics, that if you do re recreate this kind of um, new new animal, it's it could be a, a monster, but then it's still got that loving element into it. Uh, yeah, just if you've if just let me know if you remember that scene, but it really just sort of um, burnt a hole in my memory. Been a whole, um, but well, left a mark in my memory anyway. Um, and it, yeah, it touched me on that in that personal level. So I don't know whether um, that's affecting my ideas on eugenics, but yeah, that's that's one of those little ideas that came into my mind. Um, yeah, I think um, I've covered a lot of aspects there. I just want to add one final thing. So let's go back to um mr einstein now he um thought of the theories of relativity on um on just um by daydreaming a lot so he would spend a lot of time daydreaming rather than pure analytical focus so just be wary of this little intelligent thing maybe this hyper full focused full caffeinated 
idea of thinking isn't necessarily the realm to get the greatest ideas. And the greatest ideas are the things that push forward humanity um, uh, to a better world. Um, so um, let's think about that. Maybe these daydreamers at school which get penalized, maybe they're the ones that have the greatest answers. And we're looking at these intelligent people that can produce these fantastic results in analyzing and regurgitating data may not be necessarily the ones that we're looking for. Um, I would like to finish this on a final quote um, from Einstein himself. And he said that I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. So if you can find a gene for that virtue, then um, good luck. Um, Thank you very much for your time. I'm, I think I was babbling on a little bit there and going over a few subjects. So if you've managed to concentrate and kept with me on that, um, this podcast, um, thank you very much and um, stay tuned for the next. Thank you. And-